Hello, my name is Betty Shamia, and I'm the Mellon Playwright in Residence at the Classical Theatre of Harlem. Today I will be speaking with Alan Gilmore about his star turn as Malvolio in Twelfth Night. No, mm, mm, no, 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 oh, mistress mine, where are you rolling? Can't make, oh, oops, 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 oops. Thank you. <laughs> well, Alan, um, it's such a pleasure to speak with you today. I was blown away by your portrayal and embodiment of Malvolio, who's a character I'm obsessed with and wrote a whole sequel to Twelfth Night about named Malvolio. And I just love to speak with you about your inspiration for the character. I'd love any advice you might have for a young artist who's embarking on this incredible journey of embodying a character that is well-worn in classical literature. So please. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, <laughs> Betty. I'm so flattered. My star turn, how flattering is that? <laughs> um, I would say, first of all, that um, Shakespeare is, you know, we, I, I think for a young actor, don't look at it as something that is sacred or holy or, you know, over there. You know, it's, it's people being people, just like we see every day. The language may be a little bit different, but the ideas that make the language are the same. The passions and all of that are the very same. My way into Malvolio is understanding that he's a guy that wants to be loved, just like we all do, right? He's a guy that wants to be loved, desperately wants it, just like we all do. Lips do not move, no man must know. If this should be thee, Malvolio! Mary, hang thee! I may command where I adore, but silence like a Lucrece knife with bloodless stroke my heart doth gore. M-O-A-I doth sway my life. Excellent. But he also wants another thing that I think we all want, which is to have recognition and to have position and to have people, you know, uh, 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 give their power to you. You know, he's he's... Uh, that's a side of him that I think uh, the audiences um, see and sort of say, oh, you know, we don't like that sort of person. But in fact, a lot of us do want recognition. You know, how we use that is a different story. But he wants it because he feels eh, maybe not quite as good as other people, not quite as good as Countess Olivia, not quite as good as even Toby Belge, mm -hmm. not quite as good as Orsino. So. It's about somebody who wants to be loved and who wants to be seen and who wants to be valued. That's how I try to start with. But be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. <sighs> with it. For me, what was so heartbreaking about Navoli and Jalen but your portrayal, is the fact that the um, that this production. Um, uh, and Carl, the director, you didn't shy away from the torture, the actual physiological torture. Right. And I thought that that was compelling. And how was that, from making that shift of that, you know, finding a letter, believing somebody above your station in life loves you, um, and into that kind of, you know, very, very real cruelty. <laughs> Right. How was how did that shape? I know you said you have a clowning background, right? Um, so I'd love for just to hear you riff on that. Well, you know, I, to me, it was the text, it was the story that you just dive as deeply as you can into the truth of it, you know, and that means that you're going for, in that situation, the pain, because that's what they want to inflict on you. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you're telling the real story. You're telling the story, Betty, of a person that maybe the audience thought they didn't like. But when they see these other people that they thought they liked, sort of cross a boundary, maybe cross a little too far. Oh, the joke goes a little too far. This man is in pain. Propitate me! Oh. 
Keep me in darkness. Send Real pain. Mr. He's in psychological pain, and in that situation, he's in physical pain. And because of them, and to dive as deeply in that as you can, to me, is telling the real story. Because I think that's the curtain that you pull back on Shakespeare. He does things, and this is not the only play in which he's done it, but he does things to make the audience say, oh my goodness, we had thrown our sympathies and our love and everything in with these people, but now we see that they've done something that maybe is not, maybe goes a little too far, maybe goes in a direction that we also, that we now have to step back and say, who are those people that we've been, you know, that we've been cheering on and laughing with and, and who, who is this man actually that we thought we didn't like and we thought that, you know, he was mean and evil. I love that kind of, that sudden shift. It happens in Othello. I love that sudden shift that Shakespeare takes us through when you, when you realize, oh my goodness, I have thrown in my sympathies with somebody now that I have to sort of jump ship now and go with, go with somebody else. And we don't really do that in, um, in Twelfth Night, really. We don't really see it in, o in Othello. Othello gets to, you know, sort of have the last moment, the 11th hour aria, if you will, that really brings the catharsis to the role and to the audience. Um, it doesn't really happen like that in Twelfth Night, but it's still so interesting because some people out there, like you, <laughs> are going to latch on to that and say, wow, this man was hurt. And he ends it with a threat, right. which I think is, um, and uh, for me, what's so compelling about it is in any other world but Twelfth Night, yeah. Malvoli would just be following orders, right. you know, and you know, is in hell. Madonna? This woman's in mourning. Yeah. Uh, these people are loud. It's the middle of the night. Right. I mean, well, <laughs> any New Yorker has sympathy with, or any, you know, person has sympathy with being woken up. Right. So my response is, first of all, I don't think Malvolio is asleep. I'm not sure when he sleeps or if he does, really. <laughs> you know, and so that's, that's my first thing. So it's not necessarily about him being asleep and waking up, because as you tell, you can tell, I don't come out there yawning and bleary-eyed and everything. I come out there alert with my little bow tie on, which I love. <laughs> I, I got to give a shout out to Mika Eubanks okay. with, the, with the clothes. Malvolio uh, is one of those uh, servants that anticipates the need of his boss. And in this case, the boss that he you know, secretly covets, you know, Olivia. What manner of man? A very ill manner. He'll speak with you. Will you or no? So he's trying to do what, exactly what he believes she would want. And I think she would want quiet in the house. She certainly has uh, established that before. This house is in mourning, mm -hmm. you know, for uh, those, you know, deceased relatives. And uh, she wants quiet and she wants order. Mm -hmm. And of course, Toby is not doing any of that. So. Uh, so he's anticipating that. He's doing what he knows. And then he also, you know, goes a little bit further in a few instances and says and does things on her behalf that we never heard her say or ask him to do. Right. You know? Right. He's just saying, you know, there's a scene there where uh, he, my one scene, my one wonderful scene with Kara mm -hmm. as, uh, as Viola, mm -hmm. I say something to her as him. Mm -hmm. I say... Um, Oh, come, sir, you peep the, to, she, yeah. you know, sends the ring. Yeah. Come, sir, you peevishly threw it to her. And her will is, it should be so returned. She returns this ring to you, sir. You might have saved me my pains to have taken it away yourself. She adds, moreover, that you should put your lord into a desperate assurance. She will none of him. Receive it so. She took the ring of me? I'm none of it. Come, sir, you peevishly threw it to her. Well, she didn't mean she didn't mean that I should throw it at it, first of all. <laughs> and then he says something else. Malvolio says something else at the beginning. Oh, you should tell your lord. Well, he, I guess she, Olivia does want uh, Viola's lord, Orsino, to know that she is, that, that Olivia is not interested. So I do say something like, uh, she, uh, she, 
says that your, you know, get, tell your Lord, uh, put him in a desperate assurance that she will none of him, you know. Reason for it. Hi thee, Malvolio. So he's always anticipating and using his connection with Viola to sort of pump himself up so people know that he's important and that he has um, value and, you know, a certain amount of personal power. It's not his, but he takes it as his because he knows what Olivia wants and needs. I think that's wonderful. Um, I, I want to speak a little bit about the letter that yeah. you receive. And yeah, yeah. It would have been so easy for Shakespeare to... Uh, as I spoke to you earlier, to write, Dear Malvolio, I love you, love Olivia. Yeah, yeah. And as an actor playing that kind of reaching, reaching, this is yeah. really me, how am I going? How, yeah. did you, how was your way into that without making him completely a buffoon? Um, well, first of all, I know that Shakespeare wanted this letter to be a little bit obscure. Mm -hmm. Because just like you said, he could have written, I love you, uh, <laughs> Malvolio, signed Olivia, you know. <laughs> but that's gonna make it too easy. And you know, the fact is that we all, all of us, you know, this is another place I'm finding even now with you, this is another place where Malvolio is like all of us. M-O-A-I doth sway my life. Excellent winch, I say. M-O-A-I doth sway my life. Nay, but first let me see. Let me see! You know, we want to find that thing, that letter, that sign, symbol, or whatever, that secretly somebody desires us. But we don't want it out in the open. We want to, we want some, we want some, what is the word? We want some, we want to figure it out. We, mm -hmm. want, we don't want to be hit over the head with it. With it, I know in my own life when people are just like up front, you know, to like coming on like gangbusters, <laughs> I'm all about you, you know, embrace me. It can be a little bit off-putting, you know. It can it can kind of blow you back on your heels, you know. Yep. And so this letter that is so cleverly written by Mariah gives him just enough bait to make him want to go more. It's like, here, here's a potato chip. <laughs> oh, that was delicious, but I want more. No, you can't have more. Well, maybe here's another little hint, you know? And so I think we enjoy seeing him go through the torture, really, right. of trying to figure it out. And then we see another thing about him that I put in, because it's mine, it's mm -hmm. what I do. And that you build these things in that make it fun for you. You know, that's what I do. And so I build things in, and one of the things that I build in is passion. That when he starts to figure out that this is for him, we see him go nearly crazy, or, or, or that it, it's, it seems to be coming up to a conclusion that it could be you. The further that he goes into this letter, it begins to narrow in his thinking towards this might be me, this might be me. Wait a minute, no, 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 I'm going too fast. No, 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 I, I can't get carried away here. It's probably not me, but it might be. Softly. Yes. Because I, I, I really have no, I, visually, I have no idea what that scene looks like. I'm always curious. I would love to, I would love to see that one. I'd love to, love to see this play. <laughs> Well, we all get the chance to because yeah, you, you give us that gift it. with this I would production. Like to see it, yeah. um, I'd love to just talk about what the you know you did uh, you did the production at, in a, a different kind of more traditional theater space. Can you talk about what it's like to do it outdoors um, and how that might have affected your performance or the experience? Um, the first thing I think of, quite frankly, uh, Betty, is something technical which is that when I wear the uh, cross gartering, mm. I made it, I asked Mika, once again, Mika Eubanks, the mm -hmm. costume designer, to make the, cro the garters elastic or something that would snap. Ooh. Ooh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> to make them alive, uh -huh. to, that they're not just a, a pretty picture or an ugly picture, however yes. you look at it, yeah. but that they are a living symbol of something. They mm -hmm. say something when he pulls it and it snaps, you know, Ooh. it's like a, like a pow, yeah. like yes. a whip, 
you know, you want to say, oh, you know, that's yes. what you're into, Olivia. You know, that this is me, the real Malvolio, and I know, <laughs> you know, that you like that kind of thing. Smack, you know. So I was wondering when we were outside, I was like, you know, inside you have the ability, you've got four walls and a ceiling and everything, and yeah. you can have the ability to control that noise because right. it really needs to be a statement. And I was fearful that outside, first of all, it, you know, the sound will dissipate because you don't have, you know, the four, four walls and a ceiling. And also, you know, it had been a couple of years that we had used these elastics, and I don't think that Mika was anticipating using the same ones, mm -hmm. uh, which was fine, but she was going to come up with something terrific that would also make a sound. But as it turns out, I am wearing my same elastic, and I tie them myself every mm. night. Wow. And, and it's a very interesting sort of a dilemma of they can't be too tight and they can't be too loose. Mm. They have to be just the right um, uh, tension mm. to make that perfect um, sort of a whip sound, snap, that sounds <laughs> painful but intriguing, you know? So that was my first thing. Yeah. Meanwhile, we were mic'd. Um, so I didn't feel like we were going to have a problem being heard. Right. But I, I played lots of outdoor spaces many times without a mic, and I mm -hmm. have not known mm -hmm. of having uh, sound problems like that. Right. Um, and I've you know, done quite a lot of outdoor summer theater. I, I go to uh, Santa Cruz, uh, oh, in, yes. the, in the San Francisco Fantastic. area, regular, that's my oh, other that, home. Hey, okay. I was there just this <laughs> la you know, last summer. Oh. After I did the show with uh, Carl in St. Louis, I went to Santa Cruz and did uh, another play there outside. That's and wonderful. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, so we've outside. got you all over the United States. Yeah. Um, uh, so is there? Do you have a preference to, of of the indoor versus outdoor space for this particular production? Uh, you know, because you ask me and I don't know. I have to say I don't think I do. All right. um, um, I, I will say this, when we had the uh, indoor space, um, Brittany Bland, who is the projections designer, mm -hmm. could drop a scrim that you can't even see, really, in front of the stage wow. and project the images at the very beginning of the show mm -hmm. when Orsino is having his VR experience. <laughs> with, uh, you know, the dancers and everything. And she's projecting in front of him, you know, so that's the first thing you're, you're seeing. You're seeing Orsino and all the dancers and everything. But that, that scrim is so transparent that you don't, when you sit down, you almost don't know that you're looking at him from behind a curtain. Wow. And then she projects those things on in front of him. Mm -hmm. And it's quite vivid. Uh, the same... No, in the torture scene, I think it happens behind me. You know, in both instances, mm -hmm. in the indoor space, it happened behind, and Richard Rogers Amphitheater, it happens behind. But I can't really say, I can't really say in performing it that I do have a yeah, strong preference mm -hmm. for one over the other. I, I hadn't thought of it, so. Well, that's, that's wonderful. That means you're just enjoying the journey of bringing Malvolio to life. And, yeah. And, and, the setting is almost less important than your connection to your other Oh yeah, on, oh on wonderful, oh my goodness, Yes. so much fun. So um, we end with you uh, threatening. Uh, and for me, this play is so much about class mm -hmm. because it's everybody who's of a certain class ends up with somebody of that class and everything works out for them. Well, so. Toby ends up with Mariah. Oh, you're and right. And that's one of the things, you're see, right. that's one of the mm -hmm. things that shoves Malvolio over the edge. Mm -hmm. Because now on, she is, even though Toby doesn't have money per se, mm -hmm. he's got, he's got favor, status. Mm -hmm. he's, he is the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. He is the blood relative of Olivia. Mm -hmm. And 
she never said that she wanted that or she, I, you know, Ole, uh, Malvolio never knew that Mariah wants status or covets it, seeks it in the same way that he does. But mm -hmm. she obviously knows that about him. And she puts <laughs> that into the letter. You are so right. Because there's a lot of straw already on that camel's back. And, you know, you can see he comes in there not quite the same, mm -hmm. not quite the same when he's speaking to her. There's something... I hope that we get the sense that there's something already a little bit off with him. And, uh, and it's that marriage of Mariah to Toby wow. that does it. And that ignites the laughter and the, the, the end. Because, the, because, oh my goodness, what a funny joke. Oh, I've been the butt of your joke this whole time. It was just a joke. That's all it was. It was uh -huh. funny. Oh, so funny. Funny. So, so funny. Yeah, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm not mad. Do, please tell them I'm not mad. And I think at that time he wasn't mad. Mm -hmm. But he goes mad. For me, um, it crosses over into actual cruelty. And I'd love to speak with you about practical jokes and, and yeah. in Shakespeare yeah. and, and in your experience with Malvolio. But when they start telling him it's light out, when it's dark, right. and make him, making him question his own mind. Oh, my to goodness. Me is for, Says thou that house is dark as hell, Sir Topaz. Why, it hath bay window. What do you think was the most cruel thing they did to you as Malvolio? It, it, it was the letter. You know, it was, f for me, as the interpreter of it, it's the letter, and I try not to get kind of caught in the emotion of it right now but you know there's a moment where Malvolio is so excited and he's speaking to his friends now the audience about this letter and he gets a little choked up and saying that she loves me you know and I I'm so desperate to be loved because I know I'm not lovable I know people don't want me and they don't love me and they don't want to be my friend or any of that. For every reason excites to this that my lady loves me. She did commend my yellow stockings of late. She did praise my leg. And really, you know, you see him just trying to do his job, really. He's a snob. Yes. And everything, but he desperately wants to be loved. So for me, that's the most challenging part of the cruelty. The other thing, the physical cruelty and the gaslighting is bad and painful. Mm -hmm. I think we respond to that because now there's no fun. Yes. You know, there's a little fun in that letter and everything. Mm -hmm. But now there's no fun and it's all pain and mm -hmm. it's all gaslighting. And but he doesn't lose his sanity. And I think no. if I was in a dark room and people told me it was light, I would question my sanity, and he doesn't. So right. there's a strength there that I think yeah. is really compelling. He's really know? fighting for it. Yep. You know, you really see him fighting for, I am not mad. Tell yes. them I'm not mad. Yes. You know, <laughs> and I know that that's, you know, that's what's at stake here is my sanity. And, but he fights for it. Like he fights said. for it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Never was man thus wronged. Mm. Good Sir Topaz, do not think I am mad. They have laid me here in hideous darkness. But fine. That do you remember your audition for this role, or no? You've you had you know what I Carl didn't. Before. I did. Yeah, yes. I didn't audition for it. Carl just offered it to, and you know, and I was amazed I, because Carl, I we have known each other for a long time, mm -hmm. um, but as actors, right? Oh. Oh. So, and I didn't. I hadn't heard from Carl. Uh, you know, I had moved away from New York. I was living in Chicago and everything. But he called me. I almost can remember exactly where I was. I was sitting in my living room in my chair. You know, I must have been next to the computer. And I got this call from him. And he said that he had been sort of following my career and whatnot on Facebook and like that. God and I'm Facebook. not even a big... <laughs> poster <laughs> yeah. on Facebook. You know, I don't do a lot. I'm, I'm of that generation that I'm not messing around with Facebook mm -hmm. a lot, a lot, and no. Instagram, you no. know. No. I'm doing it a little bit more now, especially yeah. with Twelfth Night, because, um, well, for one thing, I've got 
you know, some folks that sort of help out. Leah Chang is a very dear friend of mine, and she's a photographer, and she's taken plenty of pictures of rehearsals right. that we've had at uh, the space up on 160th and Broadway. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's taken pictures of me in the role and everything. So she will post, and I will share that on my wall, yeah. you know, on my um, site. But um, he had been following some of my career on Facebook and everything. And he, you know, knew me from years ago as an actor, and he just offered me that role. And I was like, oh, my God, that's a great part. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's a bucket list part, mm -hmm. you know. How I relate to Malvolio is, is I was a goody two-shoe. I like to read and go to the library and, you know, yeah. that <laughs> in my neighborhood meant I was threatened with getting beat up. Oh, often. my gosh. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so when I encountered Malvolio on the text, I yeah. didn't, you know, I am come from an immigrant family. I didn't see Shakespeare yeah I thought of him as a hero oh wow because oh. I was like he's a hero he's trying to keep order he's and the, there's these people you know what I mean and the thing that Toby does even to Sir Andrew is so cruel yes you know and uh, so so it's just very interesting because we we come to these characters with tropes unless you're a young untested girl and reading this for the first time, and everybody's making fun of the goody two shoe right. in the in the text. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think um, Malvolio's very specific revenge might be for someone like Toby? You know, just now mentioning that about the cruelty that Toby also inflicts on Ague Cheek and, by association, Viola. Um, you know, it could be something like that, like get him into a situation where he's overmatched in some sort of some sort of contest of masculinity or of uh, of, of of military skill. You know, <laughs> exactly. Because uh, he can't shame him; he's shameless. So you right. know what I mean. Like he starts out shameless and yeah. he just continues to be shameless. Yeah, you know, yeah, like. yeah. Or, or do something to his relationship with Mariah. Mm -hmm. Make them think something about the other one. Ooh. You know, they're kind of like Othello. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking something about my spouse, right. but I can't speak it to them because it's too shameful or something. Yeah. So I'm listening to somebody else who's telling me all of the stuff that, that furthers the poison, mm -hmm. furthers the you know, the deranged ideas. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like fun revenge. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, 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 that's gonna, that's gonna do it, you know, madness and, you know, possibly do you mayhem. Think, do you think of him as a sympathetic character all the way through? Or I, do you think he, he needs to be taken down a peck? Who? Uh, uh -huh. yeah. I do. Yes. I think of him as a sympathetic character. I mean, you know, it's not apparent. <laughs> it's not apparent at first, and uh, but I think as 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 we keep watching it, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I love him so so much, and that I love telling his story, because he's a human being just like the rest of us, and wants that's the same things that we all want. You know, those same archetypal things to be loved to be held, to be appreciated, to be seen. It's just a great, great story. You know, Shakespeare and all of these classic, classical playwrights of the 19th century and before from Europe, you know, they have been, for some reason, handed to us um, in cultures other than their native cultures handed to us like, here's mana, here's, be careful with this Bible of Shakespeare. Be very, very respectful of this Bible of um, Ibsen or Strindberg or, uh, you know, um, Shaw. Yes. Um, but again, I say, again, I forcefully say that all of these people that they're writing about are human beings, you know, with blood in their veins, desires in their hearts, thoughts in their head, and, um, and passions, you know? And not only that, we don't have to be British actors in order to inhabit these things. We don't have to be, you know, white. We, you know, on the stage that we're on, under Carl's direction, he welcomes us into this world 
that is a very of color world and it's a world that has a great deal of variety you know whose is it it's not interesting it must belong to you you must make it your own and I think you do that so wonderfully Alan. oh thank you thank you for your time thank you for your talent thank you for sharing with me your insight you know as a playwright I'm always looking at the world yes and even when actors take my characters they are only focused on that character's trajectory yeah so they end up actually knowing that character more yeah. than the playwright right. and I learned from them yeah. and I've learned so much by watching you oh you know take the bull by the horns with Elvo Leo and oh. thank you for your time oh, and a pleasure such a pleasure to meet you pleasure all mine thank you thank you